Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutors Star Course series, where today we are so excited to be rejoined by our friends at the Butterfly Pavilion to learn about another invertebrate under their care. Nope, not butterflies. Today, we're going to get the chance to learn more about a creature that proves that some of the coolest critters can also be some of the creepiest and crawliest. Today, we're going to learn all about the cockroach. And I'm joined today by Kalei Thomas, who will be giving us an inside look into this sometimes misunderstood critter. Before we get started, I want to make sure that we are ready to learn and to collaborate as much as possible. So a few quick things to note. First off, throughout the lesson, you'll probably have some questions and Kalei will have some questions for you as well. So feel free to use the ask button on your live learning platform to not only ask, but also answer any questions throughout the lesson. We're also going to have the opportunity to collaborate and to get a little creative in today's lesson. So you'll want to be sure that you have something to write on and something to write with, whether it's colored pencils, markers, or a pen. You'll also want to be sure you have your cameras close by because toward the end of the lesson, we'll have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie with a, some friends we'll be meeting a little bit later on today. And if you tag us here at Varsity Tutors as well as Butterfly Pavilion in your Instagram post of that selfie, you'll be entered for an opportunity to win a children's activity book as well as a wildlife creature camp subscription. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about the details of that giveaway and how to enter a little bit later on, but for now, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things along to your instructor for today, Kalei Thomas. Awesome, thank you so much for having me again. Um, I'm so excited to talk to all of you today. Of course, I am from Butterfly Pavilion. You may have joined us for a program before. If so, welcome back. If you're new here, Welcome, I'm glad you're joining us today. Um, I do like to talk a little bit about Butterfly Pavilion before we get started. Um, as Haley already mentioned, we are a kind of special zoo. We like to show off some different little animals. Um, in fact, we call ourselves an invertebrate zoo. So what that means is that we like to show off invertebrates. Now, if we think about what those might be, I want everyone to give me a big thumbs up. Take your thumb and then run it down the middle of your neck or down the middle of your back. And you should be able to feel something kind of hard and bumpy right back there, right? That is actually your spine, right? Your backbone. It helps connect some of your other bones like in your arms and shoulders and hips, right? Um, but because you have a spine, you are actually a vertebrate, which means that all of my animals, if they are invertebrates, means they don't have a spine. They don't have a backbone or any bones at all. So we really like to show them off. And part of why we like to talk about them is they actually make up most of the animals in the world. If we look at the circle over here and we pretend that that circle represents every single animal in the whole entire world, everything in blue represents an invertebrate, an animal without backbones like butterflies or beetles or bees or spiders or scorpions, octopus, sea stars, anything without bones makes up 97% of the world's animals. And that little tiny orange sliver of our circle are the rest of the animals like you and me, dogs, cats, fish, birds, anything with bones is really only a small portion of the world's animals. So that's part of why we like to talk about them. But we also think that invertebrates are pretty important animals as well. I bet as you're looking at some of these examples here, or if you think of some of the examples um, you may have even seen near your own homes and gardens and parks, you might have an idea of why they could be important. If you wanna share those ideas with me now, I would love to hear some of them. I know we're definitely gonna be talking about one of these animals today and why they are so important and why we should care about them. Um, but it looks like some of you have even had thoughts about bees and bumblebees and butterflies. I see a word like pollinator um, around, right? A lot of them are really important in pollinating our flowers and helping us not only get flowers, but vegetables and fruits and things we love to eat. Um, some of you, it looks like, took inspiration from the spider over here. Spiders are very important parts of our ecosystem because they eat all kinds of little pests that maybe we don't want in our gardens but they also get eaten by things and they're a very important food source for animals like birds and lizards. So they have a very important role in all of this balance here. So 
It's very important to think about some of them. If you have other ideas of different invertebrates and why they're important, please feel free to keep sharing. Um, but we are going to go ahead and think about what we're going to do today. Today, we are going to get to know a specific invertebrate and how to identify them from others. You're going to get a chance to ask lots of questions to learn more about our specific invertebrate. And we're going to discover more about the overall diversity and the importance of our animal we're talking about today. So lots of stuff to get to. Of course, you know, we have already narrowed down what kind of animals we could be talking about. We went from every animal in the world to invertebrates, those animals without backbones. And even if we were going to talk about every single invertebrate, we would be here for a really long, long time. So all of these different animals are invertebrates, which means I'm going to help us narrow it down even more. And we're going to focus today on insects. And we're going to think, think about a certain type of insect here in just a moment. But in order to talk about insects, we have to be able to identify them. And if you've joined us for some other programs, you might have an idea already of how to do that. Um, maybe you've learned about this in school, but I wanna know, how can we tell insects apart from other animals? What do we have to look for on their bodies in order to tell them apart? Go ahead and get some thoughts in for me. I know it takes a moment. I, I see already we have some folks saying wings. Right? A lot of insects do have wings, but not every single insect has wings. Not all of them do. Uh, so that's a really good guess. Definitely, if you're looking at a small little invertebrate and it has wings, it is an insect, but not every single insect does have wings. Good guess. Oh, I see some of us are saying antenna. Yep, so if you think about antenna, everyone show me your insect antenna. Um, we have one, two, or... Um, if we think about it, it's pretty easy. That's how many fingers we have up, right? One, two, and that's how many antenna insects have. So we have our two antenna. And then I've also seen some about legs. Some of us might be a little divided on how many legs. I've seen a lot of different numbers pop up, but every single insect has to have six legs. And the last thing I've seen a bit thrown around are body parts. Every single insect has to have three body parts. They have a head, just like us. They have a thorax, which is where a lot of their legs and things are attached. So that's important to think about. I think about it like our chest, our thorax, and then an abdomen, which is where all their guts and stomachs are located. So today we're going to have a chance to be a little creative together and create an insect. So I want to switch over here so we can take a look. I have some rules that we have to follow, right? We just went over a couple of those rules. All insects have to have six legs, two antenna, three body parts, um, but they might look a little different depending on the insect. So feel free, um, you know, you're gonna follow the rules along with me, but you're also welcome to be a little creative starting with our body parts. We're gonna have to have three body parts, but the shapes can be a little bit different. So if you've got um, your um, paper and your drawing utensil, you're welcome to create your own insect. You're also welcome to put suggestions in the chat for how I should draw my insect. Starting with our head, we're gonna go over here to draw our head. Now, what shape should we start off with for our head? If you're drawing your own, you can decide for yourself, but if you'd like to help me out, give me some suggestions. Yeah, I see a lot of us are saying a circle or something. That's perfect. So um, a lot of insects have a circle shape. Some have slightly different like heart-shaped heads or even some like more oval shapes, but it's pretty good to start off with our little circle. So here's our head right there. Now we're gonna have to draw our thorax, which will be the middle part here. And I did see some pretty cool suggestions. Some of us did wanna do a heart-shaped head. So let's go ahead and do a heart-shaped thorax. I think that's pretty cool. And if we want our insect to have wings, maybe that'll fit right there on that thorax pretty well. All right, we have our head, our thorax, excellent shapes there. And for our last body part, what shape should we make this one? This is our abdomen. A lot of times people do like an oval abdomen. A lot of insects have an abdomen like that, right? Like bees and butterflies have a really long oval abdomen. Uh, but I think I saw a suggestion of a diamond. I kind of like that one. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a little long diamond for my abdomen. 
So that's a pretty interesting looking insect there. Hopefully um, some of you who have been drawing along with me have some little creative insects with different shapes, or if you drew the same as me, that's cool too. Um, but we have completed one part, right? We have our three body parts. Um, we are also going to be thinking about some of these other things, right? So if we need to add six legs, one last rule we might have is that all of our legs have to be attached to the thorax. So our legs are never on our heads or on our abdomens. All insects have their legs attached to this middle body part here. So I'm gonna give mine some really long legs all the way over all my words and everything, but you can decide to give your insect short legs or long legs, whatever you think works for them, um, works for you. Um, and if you do want to add wings to your insect, the wings also have to be attached to the thorax. So I think I'm gonna leave mine without kind of like an ant or a beetle that doesn't have wings, right? So I'm gonna leave mine without, but if you do want to add yours, just add them to the thorax, just like your legs. Now, the last part we have to add here is our antenna. And insect antenna can look really different. So you might decide that your insect just has a straight stick shaped antenna like that. You might decide that they have kind of like a butterfly's antenna where they're stick shaped, but they have like a little ball or they're kind of club shaped at the end or maybe they're like a moth where they have really feathery antenna like that. Or if you really wanna do something fun, maybe like a curly kind of um, interesting antenna like that. I don't know of any insects that actually have antenna like that, but I think it's pretty fun. I like to draw my insects with that all the time. But this one, I think I'm gonna go with one of my favorites, the really feathery antenna. So right off the top of my head, there are my two antenna. Um, so those are pretty good. I have basically everything my insect needs to be an insect, but in order to survive, we might add a few other things like eyes, right? Insects tend to have really cool eyes with lots of little lenses in them. It's like they can see lots of pictures at once. We call those compound eyes. So I've added those in. You might decide to give your insect a mouth I always like to make mine like meat eater insects. So they have to have this mouth that can catch their food like other insects and things like that. And you might decide that your insect has different colors or patterns. Um, maybe there are some other defenses that you can give them to help protect them from other things that might eat them. And we'll meet an insect today who has a few of those really cool defenses. Um, and I think it's about time we meet that insect today. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring them on camera. As you might have already guessed or heard from earlier conversations, we are going to be talking about cockroaches today. So I do have a couple of these friends with me. And as we're looking at them, you might see if you can notice all the things that make them an insect. See if they have um, a head or a thorax or an abdomen, those six legs. I have one who's hiding underneath here who really doesn't want to hang out with us today. But we'll see if we can get them to come out. These are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. So they are pretty special. Um, we'll learn a lot about them today and even meet some other cockroaches who are a little bit different here. We'll just turn it over. Oh, oh no. There we go. There we go. There are our two cockroaches who we're hanging out with today. Um, you might even notice, even though they're the same kind of cockroach, they do have some pretty interesting colors. So um, there is one that is just kind of darker. It just means it has a lot more melanin in its color. Um, so it's just a natural variation of the same kind. Um, but they are um, both Madagascar hissing cockroaches. You can kind of see their legs. Um, their antenna, one of them is missing an antenna. They do live together in large groups, and sometimes that means they get into little fights with each other, um, which is okay. They're totally fine, but that does mean sometimes um, they lose an antenna or a part of their leg. It's just the hazard of living with a bunch of your closest relatives. Uh, but they are pretty interesting little animals. So we're going to go ahead and take a close look. It is hard to see some of those body parts and things. So if we look at this picture, that's a little bit 
of what they look like underneath, um, we can see a little bit more of those things. So I'm gonna set them down. We'll keep them on camera for a little bit, um, but you can see um, underneath them, they do have those six legs. They have the three body parts, their heads right up at the top, their thorax, which is where all those legs are connected, and their abdomen, which is in the back there. And then of course, their two antennae, which stick out in the front and are pretty obvious. And as their name suggests, um, Madagascar hissing cockroaches are from Madagascar. Um, it's an island off the west coast of Africa, and they live in the rainforest there. So as you're looking at them and looking at this rainforest picture, can you imagine where in a rainforest you might find them? Do they live up in the trees? Do they live um, in the air, on the ground, in the water? If you're thinking they might live more on the ground, you're absolutely right. Part of the ways we can tell, first off, in their little temporary habitat here, they have um, plenty of soil and things that would be on the ground to hide in. Their colors are also really dark um, and kind of blend in with the soil, like the browns and the blacks to help them hide in the shadows underneath things. Um, so they definitely are gonna be on the ground and they don't have wings, so they can't live up in the trees. But when they live on the ground, you can see a few other adaptations they have that help them do that really well. They have their whole head and mouth directly under their body. So it's always completely facing under them towards the ground. And this is where we can think about what cockroaches might eat. If their mouth is all the way underneath them like that, um, what do you think they eat? I'll give you a little bit of a hint. We do consider them detritivores but we have to figure out what that means a little bit. So um, if we think about other insects, they might be a little different, right? There are insects that are carnivores. So like a praying mantis or a dragonfly, animals that eat other animals. Um, so these praying mantises might eat other insects like crickets, same thing with dragonflies. And then we have some other insects that are gonna be more herbivores, right? Our plant eaters. Um, so this giant katydid, which is that really big green insect with the kind of oval face, is a really big plant eater. And one of my personal favorite insects, that little milkweed beetle with the red and the black spots, is another plant eater. He likes to eat the plant called milkweed, kind of like some famous butterflies we might know about. So those are carnivores and herbivores. We also have omnivores, things that eat both meat in animals, right? But what is a detritivore? What do cockroaches eat? Well, the answer is a lot, basically anything. They really like to eat um, fruits and vegetables, but they will eat both fresh fruits and the really gross, decaying, rotting fruits and vegetables, right? Does anybody have any like lettuce or um, bananas or anything in their house right now that has probably gone a little bit bad? I definitely do. I definitely have some lettuce that's not quite good. Um, but that's something that the cockroaches would love to eat, even if it's a little um, on the rotting or even molding side. They don't care. They also are totally happy eating meat or carcasses, right? Dead animals, things like that. Um, and even you can see a couple of our cockroaches in the back room um, fighting over a little piece of dog food. So they really enjoy things like that too. So they will eat pretty much anything. Being a detritivore means that you eat detritus, which are those rotting, decaying things in the ecosystem. So it's a pretty good plan, right? If you're going to eat something that is dying or decaying, that's always happening in the rainforest, right? There are always plants that are dying. There are always animals that are dying. And the really important thing they do is they eat those things and then it goes through their body and they poop some of the nutrients out and it actually helps return some of the nutrients to the soil, which then makes the new plants grow even better. So they're definitely good little recyclers in their ecosystems. But then that is a little bit why they have such a bad reputation, right? A lot of you may think, oh, I never wanna see a cockroach in my house. And that's kind of true, right? There are some pest cockroaches we might look at in a little bit, but. Um, 
they are actually really obsessed with keeping themselves clean, even if they are eating these kind of gross, dirty things all the time. As we are maybe watching um, some of our cockroaches here um, climbing around on the little log, um, you might even catch them cleaning themselves. They're very obsessed with it. So they might run their antenna or their mouth, or their antenna through their mouth or their legs through their mouth to clean them off. Um, they also, are just going to be very aware of where they are and trying to make sure that they don't get too dirty. If you were gonna eat gross stuff and live in gross stuff all the time, you would wanna make sure you weren't gonna catch a disease or anything like that. The other thing these cockroaches will do to keep themselves kind of clean is actually um, have a bit of a partnership with another animal. Um, every once in a while, you can see a little tiny bug scuttle across their backs. And these are mites who actually live on and around the cockroaches and partially participate in helping keep the cockroaches clean. Um, these mites really like to eat the leftover food that might get stuck on them, or even if there's some parts that start molding or things like that, they'll clean all of that up, which is part of what helps keep the cockroaches nice and healthy. But as you're looking at this little mite here in the picture, I wonder if a mite is an insect, just like the cockroach. What do you think? If you think it's a insect, say yes, a mite is an insect, or say no, it is not in the comments. Seems like there's a little bit of disagreement, which is okay, um, but mites are not insects. As you see on their bodies there, they really only have about one body part and they actually have closer to eight legs, which makes them an arachnid more like spiders or scorpions. So this is a little partnership between a very, very tiny arachnid and a slightly larger insect. So we thought about how cockroaches eat, where they live, but there's also um, an idea about how they grow. We might be wondering that ourselves. I think I've seen a couple questions come through. Um, and they do grow in some kind of weird ways, starting with how they produce eggs. So most insects lay eggs, right? Um, and cockroaches aren't that different. They still have eggs but they are a little different in what happens to those eggs. So in this picture, what you're looking at is a female cockroach who has pushed a line of eggs outside of her body. And these eggs are gonna be fertilized outside of her body. And then she's gonna pull them back into her body and let them incubate there, kind of like a chicken sitting on her nest of eggs, right? Except it's inside her body. And then those baby cockroaches are actually going to hatch inside of her and crawl out once they're ready. Um, so they do kind of look like they give live birth because those eggs hatch inside of them and the babies come out. Um, so it is a little bit different from how some other insects um, might reproduce or might lay their eggs. Um, and once they come out, uh, we might think about how these little baby cockroaches are going to grow into their adult phases. Now, I bet some of you know how some insects grow already, right? If we think about butterflies or bees or beetles, how do insects like that grow? Do you have any ideas on how a butterfly or a bee or a moth might grow through its life cycle? I've seen some of us start with eggs, right? Just like cockroaches, they have eggs, except Maybe they lay the eggs outside of their body and let them hatch. Now I'm seeing some of us say caterpillar or larva um, or cocoon, right? So there's a few different stages we might be thinking about. For a butterfly that goes through something like metamorphosis, they're gonna start as an egg and then they'll go into a caterpillar, which will then go into a chrysalis and then go into an adult butterfly and the adult butterfly will lay eggs and the whole process starts all over again. Now, something that goes through all of those stages, the larva and pupa, all of those different things is going to go through complete metamorphosis. But a cockroach is going to do something called incomplete metamorphosis. It's going to be missing one of those stages. So it'll have the eggs still, but then instead of calling the babies like you see here, larva or caterpillars or something like that, we call them nymphs. 
And instead of going into a pupa stage or a chrysalis or some sort of little shell at some point in their lives, these nymphs are just going to shed their skin over and over and over again until they become an adult, right? So there's no real big change that happens. They're just going to be getting bigger and bigger until they become the adult stage. And they're never gonna have this point where they kind of shut down, go into a little shell um, and come out a completely different animal like the butterflies do. Uh, there might be a few different nymph stages where they're going through um, different sizes and shedding different times, um, but they will stay pretty much looking the same. There are some cockroaches who start off not having wings, but then eventually get wings. So there are a few little changes that can happen as they grow, but for the most part, they are going to look pretty similar as adults. And one thing you may have been wondering when I first introduced these cockroaches here, I called them Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And so some of you may be wondering, well, do they make a sound? Do they hiss? And they absolutely do. Let's take a look at this guy right here. So that is a hissing cockroach. It's just like these guys. Sometimes when they're poked or bothered, they make that hissing sound like a snake. They're trying to tell you to leave them alone. There's something big and scary, right? Even though they really aren't. They're just hoping that you leave them alone and don't eat them. Uh, cockroaches and all insects have little holes on their bodies called spiracles, which is how they breathe. So insects actually don't breathe through a mouth or a nose like we do. They breathe through little holes all along their bodies. And for cockroaches, there's a set of these holes that instead of pulling air in, they push air out really quickly, which is what makes that hissing sound. Uh, so that is how they are able to produce that sound. Again, we might hiss through our mouths or like a cat might hiss through their mouth, uh, but the cockroaches are actually doing it through little holes on their bodies. And we do have um, a way to tell um, if cockroaches are boys and girls. I'm actually gonna take a look at the ones that we have real quick to see if we can take a guess. So let's take a nice up close look. Now I will tell you from what I can tell, both of these are the same. So they're either two boys or two girls. You get a couple different angles there. I wonder if you had to guess right away, what would you think are these boys? or are they girl cockroaches? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be a little hard to see. <laughs> They've definitely found a nice little spot to rest there, but let's see. If you were guessing that they were boys, you're absolutely correct. Part of how we can tell has a lot to do with the very front of their bodies. So boy cockroaches have these little bumps or little horns on their heads um, that we can use to tell them apart, whereas a female just has a very smooth head. Um, so the both of them that are right in here with us are males because they have those little bumps on their heads. Uh, it's one of the easiest ways to tell, at least for the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. And as some of you may have been wondering, a lot of you are like, well, aren't cockroaches pests? Aren't they bad to have in your home? And sometimes they are. There are about 4,500 species of cockroaches in the world, over 4,000 species. And of all of those species, only about 30 or so at most are considered pests. So that means that about 30 of them are considered bad or annoying at the very least to have in your home. So in the picture here, we have some German cockroaches. These are ones that you can find all across the United States. Um, American cockroaches, Australian cockroaches, those are all going to be pest varieties. But ones like the Madagascar cockroaches we have here today um, are going to be um, not considered pests. They don't really live in areas where um, they're going to be invading people's homes or anything like that. So keep that in mind. There are some, um, like with anything, there's some good and some bad, right? And with the cockroaches, there are some species maybe we don't want in our homes, but there are definitely a lot of species that are very important to their ecosystems, like the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. 
In fact, there is a lot of variety in cockroaches overall. There are some really big cockroaches, like this species of megaloblata that lives in South America. They're actually about four inches long. So if you have a crayon nearby, a brand new crayon, that's about how big they are. And they've got these big wings, um, but they are only found in Central and South America. So there's some like that. There's also some like the smallest. This is a brown banded cockroach. Honestly, probably another pest species that lives in many parts of the United States, uh, but they're very, very tiny. They're only about the size of a penny. Um, so if you see any pennies lying around, that's about the size of one of the smallest cockroaches in the world. And as I said, you can maybe even find some of these in your areas. But beyond that, there's a lot of diversity in just how these cockroaches look. So um, there's some that look very similar to the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. This is a Halloween hissing roach. So it's just got some brighter colors than the Madagascar ones here. There are some that are a lot different. These are some giant South American cockroaches. Um, so they are in the similar areas as the largest cockroach that we just saw. They are pretty big, um, but they do have these wings. These are some of the ones that I just said will kind of change how they look from babies to adults. The babies look a lot like the Madagascar cockroaches, to be honest. But then as they get bigger, eventually they're going to shed their skin at one point and reveal these really big, beautiful wings. And that's actually what has happened to that cockroach in the very bottom picture, the one that's like all white. It has just shed its basically baby skin and become um, an adult with its adult pair of wings. Now there are some like the domino cockroach, which I think are very, very pretty. There are these beautiful black with white spots. Um, and they can just prove that cockroaches can come in a lot of different looks and they don't always look um, like what we might expect a cockroach to look like. And before we really get into some of the questions I maybe haven't answered yet, I do want to share with you the story of the Simondola cave roach. So these are some of the cockroaches we saw a little earlier. You saw him just um, steal that piece of dog food away from his friend there. Um, but they are a really interesting roach with a kind of unusual story. So they're considered an extinct roach because they actually are extinct in the wild. Um, part of the story goes that they were found in this one cave in Africa and um, people were deciding to do some mining in this cave. And when they sent in a team of biologists to investigate the area, um, the biologists discovered that there was this species of cockroach here that they couldn't find anywhere else in the world. And they were trying to tell them about this, but people decided it's just a cockroach, we'll mine in here anyways. Um, but luckily, the biologists were able to take a few of them and raise them up. These are now really popular in the pet trade, so they aren't extinct entirely, but you can no longer find them in their natural habitat. So it's just an important story to remember that, especially if we care about um, these tiny little animals, um, we can do really big things for them. These animals would be entirely extinct if um, it weren't for those group of biologists who saved them and took a few of them. So just an important little story. And I think they're really cool looking too. They've got that beautiful like black coating to the top there. But that is a lot of what I have that I wanted to share with you right away. If we do have some questions that I didn't get to quite yet, we can maybe answer some of those now. I'll go ahead and switch the camera back to me. I know it's kind of fun to look at those little guys sometimes, but. <laughs> Oh, that is so wonderful. And I had no idea there were so many different colors, so many different patterns than just the ones that might startle us when we find them in our homes. Now, we had some really wonderful questions, many of which you answered throughout the presentation. But before we get to those questions, I'd love to give everyone an opportunity to smile and pose for that selfie. So as a quick reminder, if you post, post these selfies on Instagram and you tag us at Varsity Tutors, as well as Butterfly Pavilion, you'll be entered for the opportunity to win the children's activity book that Kalei is demonstrating or showing for us, as well as that wildlife creature camp subscription, 
where in this one week camp, you'll have the opportunity to learn more about all sorts of wildlife from incredible insects, such as the ones we saw today to magnificent mammals to some pretty rad reptiles. And you'll also get the chance to complete unplugged and after camp challenges and receive some specialized content from our camp guest stars. So hopefully everyone's had the opportunity to grab your cameras and well, get to, to, you know, take a selfie with our guest stars of today. So I'll pass it back along to you, Kalei. Awesome. Yeah. So definitely get your picture with these guys. You know, a lot of people will ask me if these guys have names and they do not have names. So perhaps when you're taking your picture and posting it, um, you can tell us your idea for what to name these guys today. So uh, remember, they're both boys. They do have those little bumps on top of their heads. Um, but well, I'd love to hear some of your name suggestions for sure. <laughs> So we did talk about some of you who may have joined a little late. Um, you'll notice that they are actually really different colors, right? So the top one here is a typical, what you'd expect to see of a Madagascar hissing cockroach. Um, but the bottom one is one we call more melanistic. So it has a lot more melanin in its skin, which gives it that darker color. So they are the same type, just slightly different colors based on what their skin is made up of. So definitely um, pretty interesting. It does mean they're different from some of those others, right? We saw the Halloween hissing roach. Those are different species that just look similar, but these are actually the same kind. Wow, thank you so much, Kalei, and our Thanks. guest stars for, for posing so nicely for us. <laughs> we had some really wonderful questions that it looks like we've got some time to answer. And first off, a kind of an interesting one. Uh, students are curious whether you can communicate with the cockroaches and like, you know, ones we might see in movies, whether they can be trained? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if we've ever tried to train cockroaches. Um, you can train a surprising amount of animals. I've seen fish be trained, um, all sorts of animals. So um, it could be that we just haven't really tried yet. So maybe you saw they really liked the dog food. Maybe they need that good motivation of some of their favorite foods. Maybe we could teach them a few things based on that, but I don't think we've tried yet. And I don't know if there's really a way to communicate with them. They definitely have a few ways to communicate with us, right? If they're feeling scared or stressed, they can make that hissing sound. And that's a good sign to us that maybe we should leave them alone and give them some time away from hanging out with these big, scary humans like me, right? Um, but we don't really have a good way besides just giving them food and giving them everything they need to communicate with them. It's really, we rely on a lot of what they do and how they behave to tell us um, what they need. Absolutely. And I yeah, certainly puts things in perspective that if you might find that you're a little fearful of a cockroach, imagine how they're feeling with, you know, a being that's much larger than themselves invading <laughs> them. <laughs> um, we had a cliche for a reason, but they are more scared of us than we are of them, for sure. <laughs> we had a really interesting question, a student who is wondering that whether it might be a good thing if they encounter cockroaches in maybe their gardens or in their compost, given what you mentioned about how they help the dirt. Yeah, so especially um, in some more humid areas, I am here in Colorado and we're pretty dry, so we don't encounter too many natural cockroaches outside of our homes. Um, but especially if you live in an area that's really naturally moist or um, has a lot of humidity, it could be a really good thing to see cockroaches, um, especially in your compost and gardens. I'd say I'd encourage that for sure. Um, it's when they are in our homes or in our kitchens, often that's when it gets in trouble. Um, even though they are obsessed with keeping themselves clean, often they do still carry diseases or mold or things that we just wanna keep out of our kitchens. But in other places, that might not be such a bad thing. Um, Definitely, um, I've seen them in, um, oh, like our rainforest. We have a rainforest full of butterflies and we have lots of cockroaches in there. Um, just naturally, they help recycle some of those plant nutrients um, that are really important. We do have some spiders in there as well. So their populations are kept down, but there's, it's all about that balance. You wanna have some of the detritivores and carnivores and herbivores you want a little bit of everything um, in order to keep an ecosystem pretty healthy. Wow, and keeping speaking of keeping those ecosystems healthy, uh, we had some students who were wondering whether these extinct in the wild species are ever reintroduced into the wild or whether they're kept exclusively under human care. Yeah, it really depends on the animal. For some of them, we can reintroduce them. 
Um, and it goes okay. Like there's been instances of us reintroducing wolves to places where they used to be, and that works out sometimes. Um, but it all, also depends on what's happened with the animals. Sometimes when they're under human care, they can pick up um, parasites or diseases that don't hurt them, but if we release them into the wild could cause a problem um, in the ecosystem, even though they used to belong there, now they have something else that can cause a problem for the ecosystem. So I imagine with our cave cockroaches, um, there's probably conversation about reintroducing them, but we also just don't know what they might have picked up um, under human care that could be bad for the environment if we release them back. So there's a lot of conversation and research that goes into um, handling those animals and reintroducing them whenever that comes up. So Absolutely. And actually, Speaking of research and perhaps pursuing a career in a direction like the one that you've chosen, caring for and learning more about uh, these species, we had some students who were wondering, maybe right now insects aren't their favorite thing in the world. They would be a little more fearful than you were to interact with and to pick up these species. We had kind of a two-part question here of, one, um, if you want to work with animals, do we need to be comfortable working with bugs? And how might we go about getting over some of those fears associated with insects? Yeah, for sure. Um, definitely, if you want to work with animals, you do not have to work with bugs. There's all kinds of animals, right? And some people, you know, don't like working with birds. So they like to work with um, reptiles instead, or people can't handle reptiles. So they work with monkeys or other mammals instead, right? So there's all different kinds. Um, you can definitely find one that you are comfortable with and that you are really passionate about. I happen to be passionate about bugs, um, but I also really like a lot of different things. So um, there are some bugs I would never want to work with. I like looking at like centipedes from afar, um, but cockroaches I'm totally okay with. So it does depend on what you are comfortable with. Um, and what was the second part of that question, Haley? I think I got so caught up in that one. <laughs> Sure. So basically, you know, if someone was interested in learning more about and being a little more up close with these insects, how might they overcome being fearful of them? Yeah, I think it's just um, being around them a lot. Um, we have a tarantula who you might be able to meet a little bit later this year if you come back, um, but we actually hold her with people on site at Butterfly Pavilion. And sometimes people, they don't wanna get too close to her, but then the next time they visit, they decide they wanna sit next to her and they don't wanna hold her. And then the next time they visit, they decide they wanna hold her. So it's just all about um, going a little bit out of your comfort zone every time, um, especially if you can find animals that you know are totally safe and that you can kind of just casually interact with. Um, eventually you just work up those little steps and can be really comfortable. I used to be really scared of bugs and spiders and things, and now I work with them all the time. So uh, it's just a matter of getting a little used to them. Awesome. And I imagine that, you know, students taking the time to be here with us today and learn all of the wonderful positive things that cockroaches contribute couldn't hurt either. It's um, a great first step for sure. <laughs> we, uh, we, so we got this question a lot, so I have to ask it. Uh, can and do cockroaches bite? <laughs> they... I think it's physically possible for them to, um, but their mouths are more specifically made to like chomp down on like plant material. Um, and I've never been bitten. So um, it might be possible, but it doesn't really happen that often if it happens at all. All right. So certainly in that regard, not something that students should be terribly worried about. Um, and not sure if this question has stemmed out of more curiosity or that they might like to encounter these particular insects, or maybe they prefer not to. But we also had a lot of students who wanted clarification just to see those, uh, those Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Those aren't something that they would expect to find in their homes, correct? No, they are definitely, um, they're an endemic species, which means they can only be found on the island of Madagascar. Now there are a lot of people who have them as pets and will bring them into their own homes, um, but you shouldn't encounter them in your home unless you brought them in yourself. So um, you're not gonna find them in your homes or your gardens unless you decide to move to Madagascar. All right, and actually, a kind of similar question. We've spoken about certain species that stay to one particular area, as you just mentioned, and some that are a little more widespread. And a lot of students seem to know cockroaches as, you know, beings that have the ability to withstand different temperatures and different circumstances, um, perhaps because, you know, they've been around for a while. 
Uh, so is there anywhere that cockroaches can't and don't live? That's a really good question. I think they're found on most continent continents. I would expect that they're not found on Antarctica, um, but otherwise I think they're pretty worldwide and can be found in lots of different areas. And I'm sure you've all heard um, that they can survive really extreme temperatures and they can ex survive like nuclear war and all kinds of things. They are pretty durable. So they could survive a lot of those things. They can survive, um, quite a few days with their head cut off, which is kind of incredible. Um, so they are really durable. I imagine, especially when you get to like really, really extreme cold or extreme, extreme heat, then you start to see them not do so well, but they can, they can withstand a lot. That is pretty cool. Now uh, it is about that time, but we had lots of students with really thoughtful questions around again, you know, pursuing either more information about these bugs in particular or an interest in a career working with animals, bugs, all sorts of different species. So do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave with the class? Yeah, absolutely. Um, anytime you're interested, especially if you're visiting Colorado and want to come check us out in person, we'd love to see you at Butterfly Pavilion. Um, you can also go to our website, butterflies.org, um, which has a lot of information about things that go on at our facility or programs like these where we do live streams. Um, but as well, um, just there's a lot of resources there, um, how to find um, bugs in your area, how to make pollinator gardens, all kinds of things you can do um, at home to really get involved and interested in invertebrates in general. So definitely check out our website. Um, we are also going to come back to hang out with Varsity Tutors in September for a beetle program, and then again in October for a tarantula program. So we would love to see you at both of those things as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. And yeah, I, I can, uh, you know, I, I think I can safely say that we'll have the opportunity to meet a couple more friends along the way <laughs> for rejoining for those future classes. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who joined today and asked such thoughtful questions and participated. We hope to see those selfies. And if you drew along with us, maybe you could include that in your post as well. Uh, and we hope to see you all back in another Varsity Tutors Star Course soon. In the meantime, don't forget to post those selfies and tag us at Varsity Tutors as well as the Butterfly Pavilion. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Bye guys.